Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. All Quiet on the Western Front, 1930. Movie thoughts. I will try to start with the stuff that won't be kind of repetitive if one watches both of my thoughts on videos, both for this one and the one for the newer one, because anyone who's watched both of them will know that there are a lot of elements that are similar. In another video I, will, I won't be giving away which ones they are, though I do recommend watching both of them, if you watch either of them at all. Now, I guess I'll start with just getting the negative out of the way. Once again, I do love this movie. I it's incredible, and you know both of these movies are fantastically well made. You know, near the very top, if not making up the very top of the greatest anti-war movies ever made. However, I do, as I mentioned in the review, you know this is more theatrical than the newer one. And I use that as a neutral term. I mean, to myself, I'm personally not much for the theatrical, but, you know, that's on account of... that. That is my personal taste. And if you do like the theatrical, then, yeah, you know, this one is more theatrical than the more recent movie. I find that it's... I, I suppose I should, some of the comedy, especially in this one, and that's again much of a personal taste issue. I mean, the when the others keep grabbing the beer that Cat uh, is ordering, I mean that's almost becoming you know that that scene almost becomes a Three Stooges skit or something, you know. There are a few unfortunate bits where, I, I don't think the movie can really be blamed for this because technology was just not that far progressed and also people weren't looking with the same analytical eye on this medium that we are today. But there are, of course, very obviously sped up sequences in this. One of the, I believe it's when they go, when they get in the trenches and, you know, ready, get, get ready for the enemy charge, you know, very obviously sped up. And there, there are a few other sequences like that. I suppose that actually more or less covers it. Well, I do, one more thing is the... I, I'm not sure I completely put it together before, or maybe I just keep forgetting it each time I watch it, but I do find the... the butterfly is just not that compelling in this. Which is not to say that the, you know, the word climax really isn't fitting, it's more of an anti-climax. The, the conclusion, the very final, you know, little sequence where he gets, where Paul gets shot. He's apparently like catching them and like you know sticking them behind glass. I don't know. Maybe that wasn't considered creepy back then. And again, you know, maybe this is just a personal taste thing. I just personally find it slightly creepy. The the practice of killing something and then you know sticking up like saying, "Hey, look what I killed." I don't know. It's just you know where in the in the more recent one. 
we see him draw a butterfly, and it's kind of he's he's attracted to its beauty. I I can accept that maybe this Pollux is attracted to its beauty. I mean, you know what? Maybe it just hasn't aged well. Maybe in 1930, everyone was you know stuffing dead animals, at least you know of that particular size. Anyway, yeah, I do believe that that covers it for the stuff that is, you know, specific to this version. So, the more general stuff. I really like the, this moment where they realize, you know, food, that's not something you just, you know, get. That's not something that's just there. You have to actually go looking for it. And, you know, the bit about money, money's no good here. Do you have any contraband? You know, do you have something that I can use? Where am I going to need money? You know, the... I, I quite like the... You know, I don't know, it, my personal, you know, my empathy prevents me from completely just hating him no matter how despicable the movie tries to make him and basically succeeds in making him because he is still just a human being but yeah just the whole I do like everything that they they do with that character you know first you know he's nice then you know he gets to this you know he's there he's, he's the sergeant he's training them and yeah it's just he is an officer and, you know, he's kind of put them through hell. And then finally he gets to the front himself and he's pretty much useless there. You know, this, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an important point that, you know, just because someone is capable of yelling at new recruits and making their lives miserable during training doesn't mean that they actually have any idea what it's like to be in combat, you know. And I'm really glad that they do get some revenge over him, even in the training. The... I like the... the, the French, the French farm girls, you know, that at first the, the guys are just, you know, trying to pick them up and it's just going horribly. And then, you know, hey, food, we have food, do you want some, you know, and then they are, and it's, you can understand why. I mean, they're in war, Th they, and their men are gone, you know, fighting war. So, yeah, they, they probably don't have very much food at all, and, yeah, they, they are going to, it's, it's just self-preservation, you know, you know, you, you can moralize all you want, but they, they just want to survive, you know, they, they miss, you know, so, several of the foods they haven't been able to get, and, yeah, the, The, the recurring thing of the amputation with, you know, the, the, the oh, I, I don't know if it's called the same in English, but the phantom pain, the, the yeah, the, the, the imagined pain, or the, the, the pain that you feel when, you know, you actually have lost a limb and your, your brain can't quite accept that it's gone, so it's telling you, oh, that part of your body hurts, you know. I, you know, first you have that, you know, oh, my, my right foot really hurts, every single the toe on my right foot, and then, you know, the others look, and then one of them can't quite keep himself from giving away, even though he doesn't say the full sentence, the other, you know, the, the poor guy there on the stretcher knows exactly, or the, the bed, knows exactly what it is, and, you know, and then later you have, and it might actually be the same guy, the one who, you know, blew it, 
who then later, you know, he's like, oh, my, my foot really hurts. And then he just, he realizes, you know, oh, that, that's what's happened. And just, yeah. And, and he can't, he doesn't want to go through life with, with only one leg, you know, it's, it's, and, and, um, and the, the bit about the boots, where you can, I mean, the, the man has a point, but it's still, it hurts you inside to realize that you've become that pragmatic, that you've become that, that callous. You know, the, the word cruel isn't accurate because you're not actually actively hurting someone else with no gain to yourself, but it is callous, you know, he isn't, he, he, he no longer really deeply, you know, he, he, he thinks about his own problems to, to that extent that he's, you know, it's, it's, it's not good manners, I suppose you could say. And that does also bring me to, I don't know, I thought that the bit with him, you know, using the boots and, like, you know, smiling and, oh, I can deal with the war now, you know, I get that it's supposed to be kind of ironic, and it does end up, I don't know, I, I'll be perfectly honest, I can't tell pretty much any of the young characters in this movie apart. I can tell who Cat is, I can tell who the, the tall guy who feels betrayed is, and I can recognize Paul, excuse me, the rest of them, I can't tell them apart. Excuse me, so I don't know if that's that same guy that we see dying at the end of that sequence, but yeah, maybe it is, but yeah, I, I get that it's supposed to be ironic, I still do think that it, yeah, again, theatrical, you know, it goes so far into that, you know, oh, we're being cheery now, and it just, it, it doesn't ring true to me, it doesn't feel right to me that you could be that cheery in the middle of this horrible war, you know. The death of Cat is, you know, yeah, it, it just, and, and it's one of the moments of the film where you kind of realize, you know, just anyone at any time in, in this kind of situation, in, in a war like that, you, you just, you don't know if the guy next to you is going to be alive in a couple of seconds, and it's just, it's devastating, and, and they only just met back up you know, after he came back. And then finally Paul dying there at the end, you know. I, I personally do wish we didn't see the sniper, but I don't know, I, I can appreciate that the film was a young medium, and I... When, when film first came out, it, there, there was this notion that you had to show sort of everything, well, maybe not quite everything, but you had to really communicate and, and there was a worry that if people back then or back then there was a worry that if people just saw him you know stop moving and they heard the bullet they wouldn't necessarily piece together that he had been shot you know maybe not this specifically but I know that that was common back then you know I, I don't remember exactly around what time it changed but definitely you know long after this, I think it was like the 50s or 60s, that, you know, the filmmakers started actually cutting things out and just saying, you know what, the audience will piece it together themselves, they, you know, and maybe, to be fair, maybe they wouldn't have pieced it together back then, you know, maybe, you know, with, with film still being so new, maybe people wouldn't have pieced it together, but, but yes, I do think that it, it takes away from the shot. I, I get that it's supposed to build tension as well. And it, it's well shot, it's well edited, I just, I do think that it's fundamentally the wrong decision to actually show the sniper. But it's still a, a powerful conclusion. The... Paul in the... Is, is that a trench? I guess it's like a, a crater, more like, I'm not entirely sure, but, but when he's down there 
and the, the Frenchman comes in. W what I think works really well is that right until after he stabbed him, every single French soldier that we see, including the man Paul stabs, doesn't come off as being human. They have this otherworldly evil quality to them. They are the enemy. You know, you get into that mindset. You just see them as this mass that come at you, this, you know, this force that has to be stopped, otherwise we won't be safe. That, that, that's what it must feel like to be in the trenches, to be in, to be at war. To, to see an enemy and to know that they are out to kill you. And it's only at the moment that Paul stabs him that he becomes a fellow human being. And at that point, that realization is utterly devastating to both him and the audience. It's, it's something I suspect I'll never forget. I, I can't imagine how I could ever forget that kind of realization and it, it rings true so psychologically speaking you know the moment that you actually take in another life the moment that you know that someone else is going to die because of what you did is you know the very first time at the very least is something you never really forget and and this this realization that something you were you know that someone you killed, or to some something living that you that you are killing or have just killed, is is not evil, but in fact has has emotions just like you. You know, yeah, that that must be, you know, just yeah, some a, a mental an emotional scar deep in your in your soul, if I believed in stuff like that, but you know, I mean, the concept of the soul, that is. Anyway, yeah, it's it's an incredible scene. I, him, him trying to keep him, him trying to keep the Frenchman alive, this, you know, this realization that, you know, that there's no reason for us to, you know, he, he, he wants to help him. He, He's like, I, I will, I will write your family, you know, and, and of course, Paul returning home, you know, confronting his teacher who, who filled him with such, such pride and such, is that the word? Yeah, you know, so the, the jingoism and the nationalism just washed over him at the beginning of the film and now completely gone and, and he sees these children not not I, I think that the film somehow manages to both I, I feel that they look more like children the the young cast of this movie the the ones who were recruited at the beginning of the film I feel that they look more like children than the ones of the 79 version but I still would definitely say that at the very end, this new class look even more like children. I think it does a fantastic job of that. It's it's a it's a contrast. It's it's sort of a double contrast. You know, you have these kids basically meeting up with like cat and such. You know, I don't know what's that get you forty, fifty year old or something who's in this war, and it's just this situation, or at least he looks it. You know, maybe it's the war that's aged him, but. You know, and then they come back, and it's still you know younger still. You know, this is not just me. Four years ago, this is even worse. You know, they're they're sending even younger, and and you know they they were they were sending younger and younger. I I don't know if that's entirely true of specifically World War One. I. I think it might be, but I know that that's been the case with with wars. You know, as as they run out of the of age, of, of the, you know, the, those above the, the legal age, they start going, going lower and, you know, getting teenagers because the war must go on. 
but yes, that's that's one part of his his coming home, and another is the you know meeting the the parents, especially the the sick mother and the sister, and him meeting his father and trying to tell his father, you don't you don't understand. It's it's not what you think. This war is not like what you think it is. You who sit here safe, comfortable in the fatherland, smoking your cigars, looking at lines on a piece of paper. This map does not show you what the war is. I have seen the war. And as he tries to convey that, even even subtly, he's he's not even being rude about it. The father cuts him off. No, you don't understand the war. You, you know the details, but you don't understand the the whole. And it's this and and that's what he realizes is going on 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 the home front that these are the people you know the the men too old to fight or the you know the, the men who have not fought in this war are sitting in you know, in coffee houses smoking talking about well we just have to push on and discussing loudly where exactly in France they should take over next, you know, as if that was the, if, as if that was what was required, you know, and again, psychologically speaking, you can't understand these men because a part of them wishes that they were out there, they, they, or, or at least they feel guilty about not being out there. And so they compensate, very common, they, they compensate by making judgment calls about what the war is really like and what should really be done, you know. And Paul, of course, can't, can't handle that. He, you know, he, he goes back, even with, even with more days left of his Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. He, he could stay, but he, he just, he can't. And that's also rather true, I believe, that, you know, once you've, once you've been there, you can't, like, like he says, I'm no good for back there anymore. And he can't, he, he wants back. It's, it's like a sailor wanting to go back to, out on the ocean, you know, you just, it's what you're used to, it's what you're good at, it's, it's what your mind tells you is normalcy at, at this point, you know. And of course, at the, the bunker sequence is incredible. And I think the, the first time you watch the movie, not knowing exactly how, you know, what, what the outcome of the bunker sequence will be, I, I find that it doesn't repeat all that well. I, I don't know, maybe that's just me, but the first time watching it, it's just incredible. So, you know, it, it does feel like it goes on forever, and not in a tedious kind of way, but, you know, it's, it's very claustrophobic. You really feel their sense of, you know, never-ending dread. You know, it, it, yeah, it seems like it will go on forever. And it's nearly driving them mad. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.